orienting yourself to the client and understanding what their problems are and then trying to provide services that meet those needs. That has really been a very different mindset for me. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm your host, Enix Sears. This is the Business of Architecture show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets to help you succeed running a small architectural practice. And if you haven't already gotten access to our 60-minute live firm owner masterclass, what are you waiting for? Head on over to smartpracticemethod.com to discover a decade plus of research, tips, strategies, and techniques for helping you build the kind of firm that can help you run the kind of life and have the kind of life you want to live. Now, I'm joined today with with one of our Smart Practice members, Marina Architect Marina Rubina, and is super glad to have her, her here on the show. We're going to talk about her practice. We're going to talk about her journey, some pivots she's made along the way. And I, I think all of you who are listening to this interview will find this to be highly inspirational. Now, before we get to today's interview, I wanted to add a quick correction to episode 465 that we did on project management software for architects. BQE, who is the maker of BQE Core, stands for Breholtz Kazi Engineering. And BQE Software acquired ArchiOffice and Engineer Office in late 2009. And now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. So it's my pleasure to have Marina here. Marina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Marina, you reached out back in November of 2019 to me, uh, and because you had been following us for a while, had thought there might be something here for you in your journey as as an architectural practice owner. What was it that, that caused you to reach out? Do you remember what that was? Yes. I've had my firm for quite some time at that point and was mostly working on um, single-family residential projects, but was really interested in uh, Pivoting, as my friends in the Silicon Valley would say, uh, to something that is more um, density related and uh, multifamily projects. And I really had no tools or no idea of how to do that. So um, I have done sort of tried this, tried that with just sort of stumbling around. And then I thought, well, maybe I should get some help. <laughs> And found you guys. Brilliant. And then we had a call, and, and then here we are. And so the rest Marina, is history. And the rest is history, indeed, right? It's either the future of history and now. Okay. So, Marina, um, let, let's, let's just tee that up. Uh, making a pivot like that, so going from a single-family, residentially-focused practice, uh, most architects wouldn't know what to do in that situation, myself included, 10, 15 years ago. I wouldn't have known how to handle that. So it's it's you know it's not something that we see very often in the industry is someone being able to successfully make that leap from one project type to another because frankly there aren't there aren't a, there's not an instruction manual for it there's a lot of not a lot of people or coaches or or business mentors out there that that can help someone make that kind of transition but i know that you had uh, your your residential practice was already highly acclaimed you were getting awards uh, for your designs you were already well known in the community and you had started to dabble in the multifamily world because you had a, your own development project happening at the time. Was that right? Was that a multifamily project? Was it like a duplex that you were working on? or a Yes. Yes. Quadplex? So um, I have tried, um, as when I started my original um, single family practice, I tried to, you know, when you first start your practice, there wasn't a lot of people interested in hiring you. So I used a development project as a way to start my own practice at the beginning. So then um, I used this development project, which was uh, a two-unit building that I um, purchased and um, worked for um, probably, it took three years to challenge our local zoning code to um, allow um, main homes and accessory dwelling units. And there were a lot of exclusionary zoning issues in the way. So again, I couldn't find clients who wanted to take it on. So that was a way for me to be um, moving my agenda forward using my own development project. And at that point, I was um, realizing that multifamily is really, two units is the absolute bottom. <laughs> I would like to be working on multifamily projects and needed help of 
well, how do, how do I do this? How do I transition? How do I, um, do something different that what people already knew me for, because people would keep coming to me for single family homes, for remodels, but that was no longer interesting and fun. And, um, got me thinking like, okay, well, what do I do? <laughs> Too easy. You needed something more challenging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of challenging, one of the things that of course we go over in smart practice is of course dealing with collections issues, dealing with, uh, you know, strategies for clients who don't want to get paid. This is common as we know in the architecture industry, uh, a lot more common than some other industries of clients pushing off payments or clients just not paying in general or, or not paying the last invoice and all this. And so most, many architects just, Hey, water under the bridge. They forget about it. You know, that's money lost, but these, this money and having, not being able to collect the money that you're paid is is like it is literally like a, a dagger in the heart of a small firm owner because first of all it's not like you have huge sums of money coming through the practice in the first place so every dollar matters secondly it's almost a, a snubbing of the nose or disrespect in terms of your professional expertise and the value of you as a professional right and so that's Absolutely. something that we focus on of course is making sure that there's good collections processes in place tell me there was a couple you you had a couple of these issues in your practice with people who who weren't weren't paying and uh and then the smart practice community we were we were quite <laughs> overjoyed to hear some of your stories about some of the unconventional ways that you had uh collected and I think this will be inspirational for a lot of architects out there who've experienced this in the past. Uh, would you mind sharing those stories in no particular order Marina kind of set them up tell us what the situation was, the strategy you used, how it played out. I'm I'm all ears. Right. So it's a little bit embarrassing, but I'm sure everybody's been in the situation where you finish the project and you fully expect um, the last payment and people just say, yes, yes, yes. You know, just a couple more weeks and then just a couple, you know, maybe in a month. So in my experience, I had two um, restaurant projects, cafes that, um, were having these issues. So the first one, it was the last payment that cafe opened and there were constant excuses. Oh, we're not quite making money. We just need a little bit more time. Can we give you pizza? Can we give you cookies? It was just not going anywhere. So I filed a small claims court, um, claim, uh, went through the whole process and Still nothing. So the slam, small claims court said, yes, they should give you money, but they just never did. <laughs> so then I had to uh, either collect a gigantic amount of paperwork and file it again with the court to collect money from their bank account, which I could have done, but it, it was a huge hurdle. So then I, I decided to try some of an alternative option uh, of you know, I kept saying, can I come pick up my check? So eventually we agreed on a time where I should come to this cafe and pick up my check, you know, say a Tuesday at one o'clock. So I arrived at the cafe at Tuesday, one o'clock, everything's going well. It's a busy cafe, people having lunch and the owners, you know, I'm expecting <laughs> finally they're going to give me a check. And they again, no, we don't you know, just keep on saying, well, no, we're not going to give you a check. Come back. This is not, you know, what about our basement? What about your basement? So at that point, I, <laughs> it was an uncomfortable moment to which I said, you know, how do you feel as a small business owner in this situation? I'm a small business owner, just like you guys. So what do you think if I go talk to your customers about that? And they were like, well, go ahead. So sort of dared me to do it. So I sat down, like we're sort of sitting here across the table from each other in front of a gentleman having a sandwich for lunch. It looked like a beautiful sandwich and this lovely salad. And I said, I am really sorry to ruin your lunch, but give me some advice here. I'm an architect who work on this cafe here. I helped them get their building permits. I helped them, uh, get all their 
start up and, you know, open and serve lunch to people like you. And it's been nine months and they're not paying me the fee. I've already gone to court. The court tell them, tells them to pay the fee. Still nothing. <laughs> you should have seen the face of this poor gentleman. Oh my God. <laughs> Talk about ruining somebody's lunch. <laughs> he he went completely blank and you know i am completely uncomfortable my heart's beating it is like a horrible moment and at that point the restaurant owners understood that you know i'm not kidding <laughs> i'm going to ruin this guy's <laughs> lunch i'm going to go sit next to the I next guy the poor guy was just petrified he said well i don't know what to say and i'm like me neither. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the restaurant owners just were so shocked that they ran in the back, wrote the check, gave me the check, and I left. And that, w I mean, I I didn't know what to do. Like, what else does one do? But you know, apart from ruining this poor gentleman's lunch. Um, I don't know if he was a regular, if he'll ever come back, but, um, yeah, you know, yeah. at that point I finally got the payment that, that I deserved, I think, because I did my work and I don't see why, um, as a small business owner, I should, you know, give away this money because this money, um, and I think this is in great, um, part to the work that we've been doing in B of A, I understood that, you know, we constantly think and sort of excuse, oh, maybe I have done something wrong. Or maybe I have overcharged mm. them. Or maybe they're poor business and they're really struggling. And, you know, you come up with every excuse on planet Earth why somehow they shouldn't give you that last payment. But I've sort of tried to rethink through this and think, look, this is a bonus that I could give my employees, right? Like I am cheating the people who work for me, who did a great job from a well-deserved bonus. Why is this happening to us? <laughs> so at that point, it, that rethinking it that way really allowed me to sort of take a deep breath, you know, gather my courage and go sit across this poor guy and ruin his lunch. Um, <laughs> so after that, it was sort of an opening of a floodgate. So would you like to hear the second story? <laughs> yeah, let me pause you. Let me pause you there just for a second. I do want to hear the second story. This is, this is great. And I'm sure the architects listening and designers are just laughing their heads off as I would be and just feeling a sense of vindication, like finally. <laughs> so two things. When someone tells us they don't have money, that's always relative, right? It's always relative. So someone will say they don't have money until the pain gets big enough, and then, oh, look at this. All of a sudden, they have money, right? Uh, it reminds me of one of my very first products I did uh, was also a cafe, and I also got stiffs of money. But there's the <laughs> second thing I want to point out here was that there there is this there is this very unfortunate tradition in architecture and the industry of this unspoken sort of like you'll get paid when I get paid kind of op way of operating during business. I don't know if you've run across this in your work as an architect or if you've ever got this with your co consultants. Like a lot of times some firms, the way they operate, and as we talk to sub-consultants like engineers, et cetera, the architects tell them, hey, look, I'm going to pay you when I get paid, right? And that's sort of like business as usual in the industry, okay? So the problem, that that is a hugely hugely damaging, hugely terrible business practice. Um, I, I talk to engineers all the time that suffer through this, and uh, it's I, we only have ourselves to blame. So it goes back to your second point that kind of came up in your story, which is that we will tell ourselves all these stories about why we shouldn't collect. So it's actually the battle against ourselves, right? It's the battle against ourselves that we need to have. And it's the one, it's the battle against ourselves that ultimately we need to win. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the person who needed to stand her ground was clearly me. Right. So uh, mm -hmm, I, it was mm -hmm. getting over the fact that I had to, you know, gather my courage and just sort of take a deep breath and go for it. Um, 
And I think yeah. that getting to that point <laughs> was not easy. <laughs> And, and that that takes an incredible amount of, like you said, you know, it's it as awkward as uncomfortable, but it says something about your uh, your sense of who you are, your sense of boundaries, and your, your your willingness to be clear about your own boundaries, which is amazing. So let's ju- let's dive into the second story you have for us here, Marina. I'm I'm excited to hear it. Well, got better from there. So um, the second cafe, similar situation. Um, Months later, when I agreed to work for them, I said, look, I've had issues with cafes before. I am really, really serious that you need to pay me the last payment. You give me the payment. I give you the drawings. You go submit. All good, right? You know, very clear. I do not accept payment in pizza or cookies or and sandwiches. Nothing. We've had this conversation all good. Yes, yes, yes. They promise. Yes, yes, yes. We we have a standard American Institute contract. Very, you know, no, no, no discussion there, right? And guess what? <laughs> the work gets done. They get their permit. Well, so she comes to pick up her final drawings to take them to the building department. And I said, well, you know, we specifically agreed. You give me the check. I give you the drawings. Oh my goodness, I forgot my checkbook. Would you be, you know, willing to wait until tomorrow? I'll bring it to you. You know, you know me, I'm not going to lie to you, right? Guess what? Nine months later, same story. With every single excuse, my, you know, this didn't come through. We, we're behind on rent. Every story on planet Earth, every excuse... We are poor, struggling, small business. I'm a struggling, small business too, right? I'm not the bank. (laughs) So I, at that point, having had the previous experience with the previous client, I said, look, the final deadline is on, and I tried, you know, sending them emails, giving them warnings, charging them interest. I had a really good interest clause in my contract nothing. So um, it's a cafe on our main street or in our town. So I sent him an email that said, I'm going to come to your cafe on Saturday. I, I can't remember Saturday and Sunday, let's, on the weekend. And I will, at home, borrow some crayons from my children and I will make a homemade sign that says that you guys haven't paid me. And I'm going to come and pick up this check Um, and if you're not able to give me the check, I will stand in front of your cafe with my very homemade sign and protest. And, you know, I give you until the weekend. Um, so I get a response from their lawyer saying that, uh, you are scaring my clients and this is not okay. And this is not (laughs) appropriate. uh, You're scaring my clients. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to which, you know, again, like obviously crying, trying to scare me. So at that point, I have already reached my point of no return, to which I responded. And I said, you know, I came to this country as an immigrant. And when I arrived in my high school government and economics class, they told me that there's thing called First Amendment rights. And if I, you know, this is a free speech country and I could make a homemade sign and I could stand and protest in front of your store all I want. So I will see you on Saturday at one o'clock. So I made the sign. (laughs) My children and my family were petrified that I was going to get arrested. So I, you know, I, it was in warm weather. So I put on a, you know, like the least scary you know, looked the least scary, you know, put on pink shoes, <laughs> you know. Your librarian looking, outfit. Yeah, looking like very not intimidating. I made a homemade sign and I marched over there on foot. Uh, I arrived at the cafe and very patiently, I did not open my homemade sign. I had it all folded um, kind of in half and I stood there in line not disturbing anybody, being very patient, and uh, arrived at the cash register, and one of the owners of the cafe, who I've been working with, sees me and uh, completely panics, 
calls her lawyer and says, well, she's here to pick up the money. And I hear the lawyer on the phone says, well, give her the money. You owe her money. Give her the money. <laughs> At which point, again, every excuse on planet Earth, well, we don't have any money. I don't have any money in my account. Come back on Tuesday. I said, no, I'm not coming back on Tuesday. If you would like to give me, at that point, you know, get, I'm completely in deep shock and scared. And I said, look, Tuesday's fine. You can write me a check right now. I will take it to the bank on Tuesday. I'm good with that. No problem. In the meantime, her partner sees me and realizes who I am. We've never met in person, so we've only corresponded. Calls the police. And this is where it gets fun. <laughs> so they're having a conversation between the two of them. So the second partner calls the police and we hear her yell on the phone to the police. She's here demanding things, disturbing people. I'm standing there perfectly quietly, not talking to anybody. My sign's not unfolded. I'm just like, I am just here waiting. We have an appointment. I made an appointment. I came at the time that I was going to come. If you don't have the money, you would like to give me a check that I will cash on Tuesday. That's fine with me. I am in complete agreement with that. So <laughs> they have a, a thing between the two of them. And eventually the first one writes me a check and says, you know, and I said like, okay, well, put a note on, you know, like a written handwritten note on it saying, please deposit us on Tuesday at this time so that I, you know, I have your instructions and I, you know, clearly if you don't have money right now, I understand, I will deposit this on Tuesday. So, very stressful, I leave the, the building with the check, turn around the corner, police cars coming, screeching down the street. So I wave to the police. <laughs> Because they've described me to the police as, you know, there's this woman wearing a skirt and pink shoes and she's, you know, disturbing peace. So they see me walking down the street with the sign, with the pink shoes. So they, the police get out of the car and it's a policeman and policewoman. And um, they're like, you know, so what happened? I said, well, you know, thank you for coming, but I'm already you know, going home, here's the situation, this is what happened, and they gave me this check. Uh, and the police is like, so what were you doing in the store? I said, well, I was just standing there, you know, very politely. I didn't say anything. I wasn't loud. I wasn't disturbing anybody. I was very quietly, I, you know, I came, as I promised, that I was going to come and collect my payment for the work that I have done. Um, and, you know, and I said, by the way, what do you think in this situation? They said, well, this is a very unusual method of collecting payment. We have not heard of it yet. Have you tried small claims court? Said, yes. As a matter of fact, I have. And where did it get me? Nowhere. They're like, well, that's really an interesting situation, very difficult. And I said, well, do tell me, you know, do I have a First Amendment right to stand in front of the store with my homemade sign. And they said, yes, absolutely. If you're not in the store, you're not disturbing anybody, it's the public space, you could stand on the sidewalk. And then the policewoman says, well, can I see the sign? <laughs> <laughs> so she was the only one Love who it. got to see the sign. So I showed her the oh, sign. Wow. Like, oh, that's a good sign. I'm like, see, that's what I think. It's a good sign. <laughs> So oh, really, that's I, mar you know, just continued going home with the, you know, reinforcement that indeed the police said that it's totally okay to stand on the sidewalk and explain the, the situation should you choose to do that. It, it was mortifying. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to explain it, but on the other hand, again, I'm just as a small business owner as these people, right? And I'm not the bank. And I've already tried all the other strategies of collecting money. And, you know, but I also think the the thing that these experiences did to me sort of 
having lived through that, I am now definitely not going for this whole wait for your last payment because the pain that I had to go through to work myself, you know, to make a sign and go brave enough to protest in somebody's property, discuss this with the police. Like, if I need any reinforcement, <laughs> I could just pull up that memory and like, okay, do I want to do that again? Or do I be strong and collect the final payment? Or even better, like, you know, you give me the money and then I give you things. Uh, it, it just sort of, you know, at that point, like anytime I need extra ideas of why <laughs> timely payments matter, Always pull up that memory. Love it, love it, love it. Absolutely good leverage. Yeah, learn and, from and, your and, and we, we, <laughs> absolutely. And would it be fair to say that that was good preparation for what you're currently doing now? If we skip forward a bit, uh, you uh, a large part of what you do now is is interfacing with uh, with community boards and with planning, like going through the review process for multifamily communities. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But you're definitely also involved in some of these meetings where emotions run very high, where they're, they're NIMBYs, not in my backyard, people there protesting developments, and you're coming in. It, it strikes me that these two experiences uh, may have uh, helped you navigate your current mission. Would that be fair to say? I didn't think about it that way, but, you know, like if I got enough courage to just stand in front of a, you know, march over there with a homemade sign that maybe that gives me strength to present a pro project to NIMPYs, I could see that. Yeah, there's probably nothing, there's nothing you can't do now, right? Nothing you can't do. Well, let's let's talk I about this transition far, and pivot, but Yeah, it Rina, definitely from... <laughs> shifted, shifted the, the comfort zone. <laughs> So let's talk about the, the transition you pivoting. What was it like? Walk us through. How did you pivot from the single family focused residential practice uh, to now what you do now? What is it you do now and how did you make that pivot? Right. So I was working mostly on single family new homes and remodels for private clients uh, with a little bit trying to do my own development. Just, you know, maybe I did one or two houses to what I now do is most of our work is for developer clients who are doing um, <clears throat> um, projects from, you know, yesterday we got approval for a four unit project. Um, we're working on um, a 14 unit project is under construction, 20 units. So kind of infill development projects that are in that sort of zone. We also have a few projects that are, you know, possibly in, you know, over a hundred units that we're hoping to get. So it is a, it, it's a huge shift. Uh, and I think the the real critical pivot point or sort of stumbling block is how do you do something that you have not done before, right? How, when when people hire you to do their house, they were like, oh, well, you've done many houses already, right? It's that, you know, first and second one, how, how does one get that one, right? How do you, um, that was really the hardest one. When I've had sort of these situations where very early in this transition, I was interviewing for a project and these were developers who were in the process of purchasing a property. And they asked me, well, um, I think that the question was sort of, well, send us examples or something to the effect, well, like, what to, have you done these projects before? And that kind of was a big stumbling block because, no, I haven't done these projects before. So what do you say in that situation? How do you ever get that first one? And I think what, what it, later on, what I, so I really just kind of like totally kind of stumbled and fumbled and didn't know what to do and didn't get that project. And then later on, I understood was that they have never done such a project either. And the reason they were asking was, because they were incredibly insecure 
and incredibly inexperienced. And they needed that sense of like, you know, and they may not, I may not have been a good choice for them because they've never done it, but it wasn't, you know, like <laughs> they weren't asking me to send them stuff. They were just feeling insecure. So at that point, if I were to ask them the right questions and sort of say, well, tell me why you're, you're asking this question, the result could have been very different. We could have arrived at a point where like, because I think personality wise, where we were, we would actually have worked great together, except we were both new to this type of work. So what we could have done is if I didn't immediately say, well, no, I haven't done projects like this. If I were to ask, well, why are you asking? We could have gotten somebody else on our team who was had the experience like a contractor because this is a, a startup developer and they're just the finance people. So it's not necessary for them to have an architect that is exactly experienced in that. I had other experience that would have been very beneficial to them. Uh, but we could have gone a contractor, we could have, you know, got an attorney or project manager or somebody else to do it. But I basically lost that project on that. And um, it's after, you know, trying to sort of find that first and second one, then it gets much easier. <laughs> but it's those couple ones where our natural tendency, right, is when somebody asks you like, oh, I'm going to interview, you know, I'm looking to do a project. What, what do we think coming from college? We think like, oh, well, let me come with my portfolio. But if your portfolio doesn't have the projects that they're looking for, then you have an issue. Then you just tend to stay in your track because that's all you have to show. And to switch tracks is really, really difficult because it's the, the how do you get over that hurdle? Well, I have not done this before. So I think that that was really the pivotal moment for me. <clears throat> So after sort of getting over that hurdle, um, then then it worked. <laughs> and what Does is your, fo your what question? is your focus now? So the, yeah, absolutely. The most difficult part was that first hurdle. And then what what is your focus now? Um, the focus of our practice now is on these um, middle scale, <laughs> you know, uh, infill projects where we are really engaged in sort of understanding the local zoning, how the local zoning is evolving, what um, there's a lot of work in New Jersey to create affordable housing and a lot of new regulations that are coming and creating incentives for creation of both market rate and affordable housing. And if you create some portion of affordable housing, you get certain benefits. Uh, so those are the projects that we're really excited about. And I think for us, what we try to do is take the experience that we have from the single family to the multifamily, because the, the lot of work of, that we did on single family was um, kind of twofold. How to poor man's version of cool stuff. <laughs> Having worked with a lot of clients is sort of understanding what features or what moves can we make that would make the biggest wow effect, but at the same time, not break the budget. And taking those sort of lessons learned to a larger scale to allow us, I'm really interested in how to make small spaces feel large. And that's sort of engaging the outdoors, engage, you know, sort of indoor outdoor relationships. And I guess uh, this comes from California, where I went to school, and this is much more normal, and moving that thinking to the East Coast and trying to create these outdoor rooms and making smaller spaces feel larger and allowing people who would live in apartments, not in a single family home, to benefit from the same things. It's how do we bring light? So I call them... <laughs> Light, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So can you tell I started from the First Amendment? <laughs> yeah. 
Here I am with my light liberty and pursuit of happiness. So what we mean by that is, of course, light is incredibly important in all the spaces we create. And how do we bring that to people who live in multifamily housing, not just, you know, in a beautiful single family home in the middle of nowhere? Uh, and then liberty, I understand, as privacy. It's sort of liberty to do things that you want and having the freedom to, you know, live in an apartment building and not be feeling that everybody's like sardines in the can. And how do you work the design in a smart way that people feel that although they live in a larger building, but they have identity, they have their individual space. And then, of course, pursuit of happiness. Now that we're all post-COVID and people are working in strange places, some people are working from home, some people are working from cafes and public spaces and part-time, how do we create um, spaces that could be beautiful and multifunctional, some private, some public, to allow people to pursue their happiness, whatever it is that works for them? So it's been, you know... <laughs> kind of an interesting journey, but it's also very exciting to take the things that we learned from working with, you know, absolutely amazing single family clients. Don't get me wrong. You know, I very, very, very amazing people that we've worked with through the years, but taking those lessons to this level of giving more people opportunity to benefit from that. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's the mission. <laughs> Beautiful. Marina, you've been, you've been working with us in smart practice for, let's see, since, uh, 2020, basically. So we're going on three years now. What have been some of your, the, the biggest insights, ahas, learnings, benefits for you from working with us in smart practice? Well, I think that, um, I guess the biggest one is to try to sort of, it's always, trying to re rethink of how you approach a problem, rethinking, you know, like in my situation of how do you get past the fact that you have never done this project before, right? So rather than your standard approach, oh, uh, you know, I need to bring a portfolio, I don't have anything in my portfolio, it's sort of how do you rethink your mental state <laughs> and also how do you bring other things to the table and feel comfortable presenting yourself um, to the world, um, being able to do other things that you've never done before. Um, I think that was huge. And it's sort of how, how you see yourself is how other people will see yourself. Um, and then I think the other is the huge, 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 um, change, I think, in everything that I do is now it's about listening. It's about um, asking questions. And I would not have thought about that originally, because again, we tend to just sort of present or rely on work speaks for itself. But then there's those situations where that's not an option. Um, and then also we tend to sort of over provide solutions where maybe it's a solution to the wrong problem. What I've really learned from B of A is we better diagnose the problem first, <laughs> right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 we don't even know what the problem is. Like those people who asked me if I've worked on these projects before, their actual problem was that they were really scared and they've never done this before. And I had no idea that was their problem. So they, and then there were other problems. They, I would have been an excellent candidate for them should they have hired me because I knew a lot more about the zoning code and how to help them navigate that system. But they didn't, you know, we did never got to that point even. So I think it's the, the, the sort of, orienting yourself to the client and understanding what their problems are and then trying to provide services that meet those needs and not just like, well, you know, here's what I do. 
I think, yeah, I think that, that, that has really been a very different mindset for me. Beautiful. Well, Marina, thanks. There's so much more we could dive into here today. Um, I'm going to let you go now, but thank you for sharing these amazing stories. Uh, absolutely love that and your experience. Amazing pivot you've made from residential to now what you're doing. You know, not just not just doing multifamily, but multifamily with a purpose, right? Multifamily with a mission about exactly where you want to take it, how you want to impact people's lives, families' lives, uh, the living spaces of people. Uh, it's just incredible. So thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all you do at BMA. Oh, thank you, Marina. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. Today, I want to thank Dr. Ellen Ritchie for leaving a five-star review for the show. Dr. Ritchie writes, thank you for bringing out the best of your guests. Personal stories and discussions of values, thoughtful questions, and your constant regard for your guests keeps me coming back for more. Reviewers, help people find the show. So if you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. I'd love to read your name out here. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.